You are now listening to The Jason D'Amico Show. Greetings, folks. Welcome back to The Jason D'Amico Show. Hope you all are doing well, and it's so great to be back. It's been a, about a, a few weeks now, just inundated with all this other stuff going on in the studio and life in general and work, you know, but it's, it's great to be back, and I'm so excited for this guest today she has an incredible story um incredibly talented too and uh, we'll get into what she's got going on in a second but just want to give you a quick intro and background on her she's a singer songwriter and recording artist with a southern soul style warm tone and bluesy pop edge she's toured with some of dallas's top bands and musicians covering all genres of music she's open for artists such as r kelly Neil McCoy, Jerry Jeff Walker, and the Bellamy Brothers, to name a few. She's played worldwide venues as well as modeled for the Dove Real Beauty campaign and other various commercial print projects overseas. Please welcome to the show, Leslie Austin. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, for sure. And uh, happy to have you. And, you know, we'll we'll get into this um, in a second, but we we're able to discover you through Stinchfield on Newsmax and what an incredible story. And we're definitely going to get to that in a second. I want to start first with kind of your beginning stages though, with music and how you got into the business, because um, you have a, a few different factions going on between the music, the modeling I also read somewhere that you have a background in sports and dance. So uh, how did you get into all of this? <laughs> it's a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I grew up when I was as little as I can remember, I would sit in my room and record myself singing and, and I would imagine myself on television and on stage, but I never knew how to get from A to Z and it wasn't something And I was always singing and dancing, but it's not like my parents were like, let's nurture that. And, you know, um, I mean, not that they were stifling it either, but I think it's different now. They have all these school of rock things for kids that they put in the singing shows that they get them on. You know, they try to get them when they're like five years old and uh, raise them up. So I was always doing it and knew it was deep in me and my but I didn't know, you know what I could do with it or how to do anything with it. And nobody was really like helping that. So I, um, so I sang mostly growing up in churches and with some song wrote a little bit of like with friends in the church and then sang on worship teams. And um, also I did grow up obviously in a lot of church and ministry stuff. And there is an element of being, super into that, that makes you made me feel like I wasn't allowed to pursue music outside of the church or secular music, or that it was sinful. If you wanted to do anything like Hollywood ish, you know, like, um, so I, that's another reason I kind of stifled the whole thing, um, probably for a long time, but I, so I just sang in churches and ministries and worship teams until Even through college, I went to Baylor and I sang on a big campus wide worship team there. But and people would ask me to sing in their bands. And I felt like I wasn't allowed because (laughs) it's so stupid now. But because it was like secular music and Baylor, so kind of legalistic, it's a great school. But, you know, if you're singing on this worship team, everyone's already judging you at Baylor. anyway. Like, does she drink? Does she um, do other, you know? does she dance? Does she go, uh, do do secular music? I mean, it's stupid, but yeah. So basically I did not start singing secular music or with bands until after, right after college. Wow. Um, then I started singing cover bands and still singing everybody else's music because even though I wanted to be doing my own, I either didn't know how to go about it or cause I am limited, uh, instrumentally, like I can play a little guitar and piano, but I'm not like amazing on either of them. And, you know, a million reasons you tell yourself, you know, not it, uh, excuses for not pursuing something like that. Obviously it's not the most financially lucrative <laughs> business. Um, until you reach a certain level, right, you know, of course. And, uh, 
or like most people in the world, or it's too, too late. You should have done this earlier or there's, you know, whatever excuses we make. Um, so I just kept singing everyone else's music for years until it just kept rising up in me and I kept shoving it back down. And I would like watch these singing shows and just weep. And um, but just because I felt like I was supposed to be doing that. And finally, like that happened for enough years. And I was like, this isn't, this is crazy for me to do this at this point in my life to like start doing original music and pursue like full out my own music career. And, but I don't, I was like, I feel God has made me to do this and called me to do this. And as insane as it is and going against all the odds, I feel like I have to do it. So I didn't start writing original focusing on original music till like 2013 and 2013, 2014. And then I didn't release my first song single till 2016. Wow. So here I am. <laughs> but that's, that's so great because, you know, going against all odds, I've, I've had, I've had numerous guests on the show. Um, Walter, Killerman comes to mind, who's a Grammy winner, a two-time Grammy winner, who's in his, I think, late 50s now, or maybe even 60. We just had him on right before this year's Grammys because he was nominated and he, then he won. And mm. he didn't get into, into what he was doing in, in the jazz and um, world genre until the 40, his 40s. So, I mean, I've just seen this countless times, like people like yourself with incredible amounts of faith and just, you know, self-belief and belief in God and, you know, that combination and talent and just do incredible things. So uh, it's really cool to hear that. Yeah. I mean, the good news about if you really believe in, you know, the God of the Bible and who he says he is, like, then you realize that there is no that's the only reason that I, that it makes sense to do something that's against that many odds, because yeah. I know that he wants something to happen. He can defy every odd and make stuff happen. And he's also the kind of guy that's going to be like, do it on purpose to where there's no other explanation, but God. And like, so that he gets some of the glory, you know? So or exactly. all exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, who are some of your main influences? I, I read somewhere that there was Michael Jackson, uh, yeah, I mean, he's the 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 main one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was like everything. Um, just because he, I still believe he's like the greatest entertainer of all time. Like just the yeah. singing, the dancing, the um, performing, the and I mean, it's I, I know there's all there's millions of incredible, insane musicians for different reasons. Um, but yeah, he was. I used to make up dances to all his songs and like. Um, yeah. And, and my dad would like, you know, we would watch the thriller video over and over and over. And, um, so yeah, I just, he, he was one of the biggest, you know, he was the biggest that I growing up that I, um, had the biggest influence, but also like, you know, my dad was part of that. Cause he, he's really into like home theaters and stereos and he would play like earth, wind and fire and cool in the gang. And, um, a lot of rhythm driven stuff, which is, you know, I joke that I'm like African American, have some African American. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I haven't, I need to take the, uh, the genetic testing, but, um, I mean, ancestry.com, <laughs> but, um, yeah. And I sang in a gospel choir for like eight years at a black church and I was the only white girl in the choir. And that's so great. That's awesome. Yeah. But so I, I have a definite bend towards the rhythm and like, I mean, I also love other ki kinds of music, but um, yeah, things that have that kind of funky soul rhythm kind of feel um, is a lot of where that came from. So yeah, I mean, I listened to all kinds of music growing up, but he's definitely, Michael was my biggest influence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, him and Prince, I think yeah. we're just untouchable as far yeah. as um, talent and showmanship and, and just okay. range of pretty much anything that is just mind boggling to this day. And it's sad that they're not with us anymore. I know. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it, it just doesn't make any sense, you know? Yeah. 
I know it's both, both just, you know, it's crazy. Um, sports and fitness though, what, what's going on there? Because it sounds (laughs) like there's there, there was at least at some point in your life, some focus there. Yeah. Um, I, well, I grew up always playing sports. I was like a tomboy. I was climbing trees and playing outside all the time and playing. I played all kinds of sports. Um, and if I had stuck with focused on just one, I probably could have gone really far with it, but I was always doing different ones and I moved around a lot when I was younger. So I would try different sports. Like if I got to a new school and, um, so yeah, I mean, I did, a lot of, you know, gymnastics, which is weird because I'm tall, but uh, it kept getting harder and harder because I kept getting taller. But uh, gym- I was a swimmer and ran track and yeah. played basketball, played, you know, softball, played everything at some point, almost everything. But um, yeah, so I played sports all the time growing up. And then at Baylor, I uh, kept trying to figure out what I wanted to study. I mean, even though music was in the back of my you know, I thought about studying music, but people would tell me that if you studied it in school, you kind of lose some of the passion for it. Um, which now looking back, I do wish I had studied some of it, like the music theory and all of that. Mm. But, um, but so I finally decided once I realized there was a major for health and fitness, (laughs) I decided to study that. Um, and I actually loved it. I, And then I started doing personal training and uh, therapy that corrects muscle imbalances from injury and trauma and overuse. And I've actually still always done that because I spent so long trying to study all that stuff and get good at it. And it's interesting to me. So I've always done, still done some of that on the side just to help pay for the music stuff. Um, You know, I don't advertise it anymore because, you know, even though all musicians and actors and all of us have like five side hustles, most people don't want to advertise that, you know, so that people take you seriously in your craft, but right. So yeah, I've always been uh, into wellness and health and fitness um, personally. And just, it's an interesting and I, I like helping people um, in a lot of ways. So, so yeah, I've always done some of that on the side also. It's such an important um, field, you know, even beyond just medicine in general, uh, looking at it from a a standpoint of preventative Mm -hmm. care, which I think health and fitness, it's exactly what it is. And it can, it can prevent so many diseases and just things from blocking up in the body. Yeah. And if people understood like the even natural medicine and food and the power of all these like, quote unquote, alternative things that doctors and news media doesn't want you to know about um, is it's insanely powerful. And that's kind of my direction with it. I I'm not really into like traditional drugs and all that stuff. I like there's natural cures for everything, um, I believe. And I've seen it. So, Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the side that I focus more on. That's great. Well, let's definitely get into the stench fields, um, uh, situation and, and you being on there because that was an incredible story. Um, you recently had a, an encounter and I'll just kind of leave it at that and let you take the the lead here with explaining what happened, but, um, wow, what a story, what a testimony. Yeah. So I was just parked right in front of my apartment building. Like I always do. Cause it's a nice part of supposedly a nice part of town, safe, you know, well lit. And, um, and literally the car is like, a few steps from the building and it's well, you know, it's all lit up and a bunch of people park right there. So it was a Tuesday night and I had gone to some blues jam and was coming home at like 1215. I mean, it was only 1215 and I park my car and I get out and there's just a few steps up to the building. And I think right when I kind of hit that first step, someone jumped on my back and, um, 
like threw their body on my back. And because, I mean, it happened so fast. And the only thing I could think, because what was really happening was never even crossing, was never even, I couldn't imagine. And yeah. I just thought for a second, I was like, is this someone I know, like playing a joke on me? And then he pulled my neck back with his arm. And then I saw, you know, a gun and felt it. And then I felt it on my face, on my head. And that's when it like, you kind of, uh, everything changed. I was like, I mean, my first thought was, okay, I'm about to die. And then you kind of feel sick. And then, um, wow. and then you kind of go subconscious, like it's hard to explain. Cause you always imagine if stuff like this happened to you, I would say this and I would do this. And I would, I no longer was thinking about what to say or do could I, it's like, I couldn't think of anything and I couldn't like my body, something just took over and I just did whatever my body just would do something and something just would come out of my mouth. It's not like I was controlling it or thinking about it. Cause you're like, you're basically about, you think you're dying, you're about to die. And you just kind of go into this obviously fight or flight, but there's also this, like, I don't know. It's like this almost subconscious, like blackout zone. So I just, um, once he had the gun to my face, he said, give me everything you have. And I just, only thing I could get out of my mouth, I just said, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And because I know, you know, I've walked with God since I was 10 years old and I've yeah. prayed a lot of years in my head. And, and I know, you know, the Bible says the demons flee at the name of Jesus. And I know yeah. there's actually power in the name of Jesus, but I still didn't even have time to think through that. I just, because I know that innately and it's, it's in, so ingrained in me, that's what came out. And I just kept saying, I just kept saying, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And, you know, I'm crying and shaking, but he, um, then he pushes me off of him and he grabs my purse and my keys. He's like frantically going through my purse. He's like, do you have any jewelry or, and I was like, no, I said, you can have whatever's in the purse. And then I just, you know, I could have run off. I could, I'm just standing there staring at him. And then I just kept saying, and then I said it again, I was like, in the name of Jesus, I'm begging you, why are you doing this? in Jesus name, in Jesus name. And the guy was like, kind of getting more uncomfortable by the minute. <laughs> like now looking back, you know, he was, you know, he's kind of trying to hurry this thing. Well, obviously, so he doesn't get caught also, right, but right. So, and I kept thinking like subconsciously, I'm like, why is no one seeing this? Like, where is it's only 1215. Isn't someone going to walk up and, um, and he, so he grabs my keys and my purse and he runs over to my car to steal it um he gets in the driver's seat starts the car like could have already driven off wow and i should have just like run away and called the cops and my body just starts walking over to the car i ran over to the car where he was which is dumb i know i don't recommend it. i stench feel was like i got on her for this um, <laughs> I, he's like, I don't recommend this, but, uh, and I, like I said, it was just like well, the spirit, the spirit woman the took Holy over spirit moved that's, me because if I happened. hadn't done this second part of the story, there would be no miracle part to the yeah. story. So he, I ran over to the passenger door when the guy's stealing the car, I flung the door open, dropped to my knees. And I just said, in Jesus name, please, I'm begging you. And he points the gun, like right at my face, this close. And he said, you see, I have a gun here. I can kill you right now. And I just, he had a mask, like a COVID mask on. And I just kind of looked in his eyes and I, as I'm like crying and I just said it like with everything in me, I was like, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus name. And the guy just like, it's like his body kind of collapsed for a second. He put his head down. I mean, it was fast, but like he right. stopped he turns the car off, throws it in the floorboard over by where I am, throws my purse. And he said, with his head down, I'm not taking any of it. And he gets up and he just walks away. <laughs> I know. I mean, I've preached Jesus, the name of Jesus and the power of it my whole life. And I believed it, but to see it literally disarm, like a man with a gun in my face twice and he could have already stolen the car. He could have, a lot of things could have happened. And literally just the name of Jesus shut the man down and he left it all and walked away. That, that doesn't happen except for the power of God, you know? 
It's just so incredible. It's just so remarkable. And it's, it, I'm so glad we have you on because it, it kind of like on Stinchfield, they have, you know, it's a, it's a program show. You gotta, you gotta get it in. You know, I know it was so fast. I was like, that's it. Like <laughs> they yeah. were like, I thought it was going to, we were going to have longer and it was like, sh- 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 you're done. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and this, I think it just gave even cause I got even more nuggets out of this with, with more detail. And it, it was funny how you said, well, you know, there wouldn't be that powerful part of the testimony unless that there was the part B to it. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause what I was thinking right before you said that was, well, your spirit, like the spirit moved you, your spirit woman took over, yep. you know, your, your, your Christ minded nature took over in that situation. And I mean, that, mm-hmm that's just supernatural. I don't know how else to explain that because you went, you went right towards the conflict, you know, it was supernatural. Cause I didn't, even when he put the gun right in my face again, it's like, I didn't look at the gun with my eyes. Like I just, yeah. I, mean, I knew he did it, but I just, I was taken over by the Holy spirit. And I just looked the guy in the eyes and said the name of Jesus over and over. And he just, and I, I had this vision, you know, I didn't see, I, I, right when he ran off, I watched him for like a split second just to see him running off. But then I, the fight or flight thing, like the panic took, I, I like fell into the seat and just started like, <laughs> sorry, just yeah. oh, like hyperventilating and like crying just cause it like you, you finally can like come back to reality. Yeah. Um, so I didn't like watch where he went to very far, but I kind of had this vision of him like running off and falling to his face, like in repentance before God, you know, cause wow. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God touched wow. that man's life that night. I don't know if he did, but I know that God affected him that night. And I know that tons of people have been praying for him, including me. And that's the crazier part is I've never once felt like angry at him or like, I see him as this I, he was probably in his 20. I mean, I barely saw his face and it was covered, but he was either in his twenties or maybe early thirties. I don't know, but he, yeah. all I f- feel about him is that he's like this super broken hurting kid. That's like, needs to be healed. He needs God and he needs to be healed. And he's yeah. probably had a lot of trauma, a ton of trauma and abuse and whatever. And I would give anything to talk to him. And, um, actually the detective finally called because the CSI came later and they fingerprinted. And I think they said we will only call if we find something and that we keep playing phone tag, but I'm dying to know if they found him and I would love to go talk to him and like tell him about Jesus. But a lot of people have been praying for him and I have a feeling hopefully, hopefully God got a hold of his life that night and he'll be forever changed, you know? Wow. Incredible. And, and, th- and, you know, I want to take a second to really, I know this, this can be heavy to, to go through this story over and over again with, you know, kind of like some PTSD and, and, you know, I want to be sensitive to that, but I really, I really appreciate you walking us through this again, because what, I mean, what, I, I I'm, I'm speechless. It's just like, what a story. That's what I keep saying is what a story, what a story. And I'm just so thankful that you're okay number one but number two again for the testimony itself it's just incredible yeah and i've and the the really cool part is i mean i know beyond a shadow of a doubt why god obviously he let this happen because he knew i was going to go tell the whole world yeah what he did and because i so many people this day and age need a miracle to believe like it's hard for people to get their head around it unless there's some tangible miracle and I've had these cool stories of people messaging me and be like, this made me want to turn back to God. And one girl was like, I always believed in God, but never really the Jesus thing. And the other night I got in my bathtub and I prayed to Jesus for the first time and had this experience. And then, and then a girl brought me to church and then they happened to go to some brunch place after church. And guess who happened to be performing at the brunch place? She walked in she's like, are you, you're Leslie. And I mean, these stories are just crazy, but God, the, the amazing part is to see people's comments or hear their messages about how God has drawn them back to him or drawn them to him because of, you know, the story. So if like, yeah, I mean, it's worth it if just for that alone, you know? Wow. For sure. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like going to the other topics doesn't even. I know you're like, no, what do we, now so what do we such say? A down after that. <laughs> Uh, but I gotta say, I mean, working with Dove, that's kind of cool, you know, with this, uh, this national, what, what is this? The national beauty campaign. Do I have that right? So let's shift from the gun to your head. Yeah. Let's, let's shift from the gun to the, to the Dove. Um, no, this is pretty cool. Like this, this whole modeling career and, you know, having, having all these different sections, sectors and what you do. And, uh, that's, that's great. You know, I've probably seen you somewhere on a billboard somewhere. Yeah, well, probably not, but hopefully someday. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was uh, that was actually a cool thing because I, you know, I I always thought about doing it, but I again for different reasons never tried when I was younger to to get with agencies and focus on the modeling thing. Mm-hmm. And I did freelance stuff, but I didn't like make it a big focus. And then. Um, when I actually that does think that was an like actual gift from God just out of nowhere because some casting agent f- saw my picture on someone else's Facebook and she said, Tell that girl I want her to come audition for something. And I wasn't even with an agency or anything at the time, which now I learned Dove, well, for the real beauty campaign, they don't want you to be with an agency. And part of the reason now I know is because of all the usage things that keep coming up year after year that we, cause we have to try to keep track of it and follow up with them ourselves or they'll never tell us that right. like they've left it up for another year, you know? Right. But, um, so anyway, I went and auditioned and initially it was for a print job for the real beauty. And they want people that haven't had like plastic surgery or like all this stuff done. Like they mm-hmm. want naturally natural people. And, um, so I first did the print ad and they flew us like first class to London to shoot the print ad. And I was like, well, I could get used to this. And, um, and then later they had some of us audition. They said, you might get picked for the commercial part too. And then like the next year, whenever it was, they flew me to Thailand first class to do the commercial. And, um, so that was, so at that point I was like, maybe I should be capitalizing on this a little more and get with an agency. And like, actually, I mean, you can make some money if you're, you know, doing it a lot and it's residual stuff or bigger yeah. campaigns or whatever, as you know. So, so yeah, at that point, I, after that, I was like, I need to just get with an agency and kind of focus on this a little more, but yeah, that dove thing happened. Um, just, that was like out of nowhere. I mean, I realized because of how I believe and think that, sure. that was, God gave me that, but, Absolutely. Yeah, it was amazing. Let's get into your songwriting process real quick, because <clears throat> I had a chance to look at um, some of your discography. Like uh, the first song that I heard was Burned. I thought that was great. And, you know, it's uh, a, a heavy subject matter for sure. But <laughs> just well, well written, uh, you know, from a songwriting standpoint, it, it just rhymes well it's concise it gets to the point it paints the picture great melody so really enjoyed that what what was your process or how did how did that song come about obviously life experience that you probably don't want to think about too much but just you know how your your songwriting um process how does how does that work for you typically yeah um well and I don't mind talking. It's been long enough and I'm totally healed of that, but sure. gave me good song content, but yeah, yeah like, it was basically a guy that was telling me I was his soulmate and, and he never met anyone like me and he wanted to marry me. And he was like sleeping with other girls the whole time. Um, so when I wrote that song, I wasn't still in the angry stage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I write a lot with musicians because of what I told you earlier my limitations with instruments. Um, I mean, I can play some and, and I could, but it helps me and it's faster. If I can like one of my buddies that plays piano, I'll say, play some, sometimes I do it like this. I'll say, play some like chord structure or melody that sounds similar to like Adele's this song by Adele and John Legend's song, this, and like, I'll tell him some things to like combine and start messing around with stuff. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I have a great ear. I did not study music, but I have a really like, I hear immediately when something's off, including when I'm off. <laughs> um, and, and I know like, I may not know why or how to articulate what's always wrong, but I know if, if something's like, yes, I like that works, that's going to work, or this isn't working. So, um, he played, you know, some melodies and we kind of figured out some progressions like of the, we'll figure out if it's going to be the chorus section or the verse. And then, um, sometimes because of the way my brain works, I don't always want to write all the lyrics on the spot. I hear the melody immediately, like right. what, how I'm going to sing it, but I don't always want to just write it all immediately because of my brain. I like to like, and just the way my brain functions, I'm even the same in, way, even in school, like in testing, yeah. I, I could have used that longer testing period with it. You know, I didn't know back then they let people have, I didn't know that I, you know, my brain functioned differently really. But um, so for me, it helps if we were, I record some of the ideas he's playing and then I take them and go sit with it for a little while on my own. And then I can just write the whole song. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how I've written. That's how we wrote burned. Um, so he did, we did that piano kind of figured out a piano melody. And then I think I had it on my phone and I was flying somewhere the next day. And on the flight, I wrote the whole thing like on a flight and just listening to the, and sometimes like if we hadn't done a bridge, all I can hear the bridge in my head after we've got something already kind of going. Um, so that's how I've written several songs with him. Um, which I guess in some ways, some of that's like top lining, you know, uh, but yeah, I, also maybe. Do, I do also hear my own melodies and sometimes change, you know, things myself. So, yeah. So usually I write a few of the songs that before that one that are more commercially pop sounding, like hold up and all mm -hmm. right. And nobody, that was a producer in LA that did those. And he kind of was, I was having to kind of work around some of the beats he already made or, what he made around it. So, and I was still learning, like, how much can I, you know, make you do what I want you to do or, and how much do I have to do what the producer wants me to do? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. So for me, it works best usually to write with a musician and kind of just occasionally I'll get lyrics first, but for me, um, sometimes it's finding a, the melody or the style I want to go with melodically first on the instruments and then writing, hearing what comes from that um, and writing around that. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I use the voice memo app all the time on yeah. my iPhone. There's like thousands of logs over the last however many, you know, 10, 12 years. And some will just work, you know, the, you, you have that 15 second bit or that hook you don't mm -hmm. have anything for it and then yeah. six months or a year goes by later and it's there you know so it's a really powerful tool yeah yeah that's true because sometimes like those are songs sometimes some of them i have on there that i'll go back and listen to like you said and i'm like oh i haven't done anything with that and that's i i could hear that working you know yeah 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 for sure that's recording process for you you know it sounds like working with other producers um kind of like a a pretty heavy collaborative process um kind of kind of walk me through that a little bit is it is it typically just you and a producer or is there a band involved like what how do you usually like to work when it comes to you know the the process of recording uh well, I've still yet to find like my guy, my producer that like, you know, you hear about these people form these great relationships and they write together and they, you know, spend all this time. The producer starts understanding and, you know, right. I don't, I've usually just hired someone and like tried to get the recording done and not that they haven't all, you know, added some cool things for sure. But I, you know, you're still paying for this amount of time and you got to hurry. You got to finish in that amount of time. And yeah. Um, so the first those three that the guy in L.A. did. Um, budget wise, I mean, although he still charged me a lot, um, he did most of the. even though I'm much more of a live instrument person, like I everything about me, like 
bends towards organic, like just in food, in medicine, in music, in all of that. Like, there, yeah. don't get me wrong. There's, I mean, today's music, a lot of it's, you know, super overproduced, but I do like some, some, you know, super produced commercial music, definitely um, for different reasons. But for me, I kind of like combining some of the old school with the new school styles, you know, but I definitely would always prefer real instruments and maybe add some of the other stuff, you know, some of the production in that. Um, yeah. But also I, I want, I love real instruments. So those three in LA, the only thing that was, um, it was a live guitar, but a lot of the other stuff, the guy, the producer did himself. And, um, but the song burned, which is closer to that was, it's supposed to be the first off my EP, which the other songs have been a little delayed in the recording. I have recorded one of the other ones, um, but I haven't released any more yet. Cause I want to make sure I have everything ready. Right. Or I just, you know, release another single and then I can't do anything again for like another year or two. Um, so this last one burned, I, um, yeah, it, it's a great studio in Dallas. Cause I had come back from LA during the pandemic. I came back to Dallas. And so it's a really cool studio in Dallas that I know Leon Bridges has done some stuff out of and some other people that have come out of Dallas. Um, but it's just a super cool vibe and the, both producers are great. And, um, but that one I did all real, like I had a trumpet and a sax player come in and record their parts. I had, you know, drums, keys, bass, guitar. Um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely enjoy that. If there wasn't, I would love to just, you know, not be limited by time and money in studios and just be able to vibe out. And like, cause I know people that when it's their studio or whatever, they all just sit in there kind of vibe and they start writing stuff and like, Oh, ha, let's try this, you know? Yeah. But if you're having to pay a lot for a studio time, that doesn't really work. So yeah. So this time I was able to do all live instruments, which I love. Yeah. It's why I built my own or started building my own when I was a teenager, because for that exact reason, I had, I had a couple of negative, um, experiences with outside producers and i was like yeah i'll just figure out how to do this so you know yeah i should figure out how to do it myself well it, i was obsessed so for me it was i i just was absolutely obsessed with the process and um i it, it pulled me to do it you know but yeah there's nothing wrong with being a little savvy with it. There's so much you can do these days with an interface an iMac and a little bit of, you know, logic or pro tools. Mm -hmm. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, but that's cool. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, we're always, I think from now on, there's always going to be this hybrid between really electronic and really organic. Mm -hmm. And then the blending between the two, um, it's, it's a shame. I think it's funny. If you talk to the, the guys that have been in the business for 50 years, they're all about digital because tape was such a pain to work on, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of younger guys like myself where we're always trying to go back. I was never there during that period, but we're yeah. always trying to go back for the tape emulation and, and all, because there's just something missing. Yeah. You know, right. for sure. So I, th I think some of the greatest records of all time were made sonically mm -hmm. were probably the, the early seventies to mm, late eighties before things really started going heavy digital. Yeah. You know, and they had enough technology to make it work with mm -hmm. multi-tracking. Right. But then it wasn't so self-indulgent where, like again, Prince, Michael Jackson, they had the drum machines, but they weren't, it, it was a nice foundation. It wasn't making the track, right? you know, but it was a sound that was dialed in specific, but then everybody started copying it. So then it just turned into this thing. Yeah. 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 So best and worst gig experiences for you. I always ask any performer this question because, you know, there's usually one, Mount Everest moment, um, and then one complete 
crap show. So just curious to see for you, you know, if you could think of one of one of each. I feel like I would need time to think about this. Okay. Um, I've we done come, so many, so many gigs. Um, we can go back to it. I will say that, I mean, a moment in a gig, I wouldn't say the whole gig was the best thing, but there was, it was actually not even my own original gig. It was with a cover band, sure. but we were playing for like 15,000 people in a convention cool. center. Cool. And I was singing, I love rock and roll. And I stepped out on the speakers and I, you know, at the end when uh, everything kind of drops out, but the beat and I was like, and I held the microphone out to the crowd and like all 15,000 people were singing it back to me. And I was like, that was one of those moments of like, okay, someday I want, I'm going to be doing this with my music and they're going to be singing it back to me, you know? Wow. Um, so that was a cool moment, even though it wasn't my own show. Um, yeah, as far as the worst, man, I don't know. I've had some really bad sound, sound problems and, or I've had guys that show up. The problem is I'm a solo artist technically, but I play with a full band a lot. So because I use great musicians, a lot of times they're also playing with other people. So oftentimes for each gig, I might have to use different guys, you know, because if they're already booked. So, and if I don't have tons of money to have tons pay them for a bunch of rehearsals we might just do one right before the show and i send them music way ahead of time but so ideally like please show up to the rehearsal that i'm prepared face like show up prepared and let's yeah. just fine tune and uh but in rehearsal they're still like reading all the stuff and you know it seems like they're gonna pull through but they're even recently um <laughs> i once we got on stage because they're so great, usually, you know, they can pull it off. Right. But if like, if it's a certain instrument that's supposed to be leading the song or like starts off with just that instrument or whatever, and my original songs, and like, they don't know my music once we're on stage, there were some really like, like just this last show I did, um, someone started my song, like two, two keys higher than it's supposed to start. And and before I realized it, I went ahead and just started singing um, because they were already sitting there trying to figure out how the song started. And it was already awkward. So I just, once they started, I just started singing. And like right as I started, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to hit this chorus and it's going to be so high. <laughs> so that wasn't great. But, um, yeah, I don't know for sure of my worst. I'd have to probably think through that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's still that's not great. Yeah, so it wasn't that's, great. That's still that's still that still counts. Yeah. Um, and everyone's like, Oh, the crowd doesn't notice. But like, I get so in my head when right. like so many things are going wrong on stage right. and they're, and they're, it's my music. And I, yes, I, there, it's fine to have some freedom in the way each musician plays it differently. But if it's like, it's my music that I've poured my heart and soul into, and I want it to sound like my music. And if you have showed up, not learned my stuff and it sounds like, I don't even know what songs being played right now. Like it's, so frustrating, you know, but it's part of the process until you can find the guys that are like your dudes that are true to you or that you can pay them enough to where they'll just be consistent, you know? Yeah. I, I feel your pain <laughs> and, and luck, but, but luckily though, ha- had certain guys that have been with me for over a decade, you know? Wow. And when I was in New York, um, for a number of years on and off, I had the same thing where it was, you you have your a list and then your subs. Um, and they've all been, they've all been pretty good. A few, there's always a few bad apples in the batch over the years, like just people with, with personal issues, what, and and then once that starts coming out, that's it. You got, you know, you got to cut the cord, Mm -hmm. but, um, it's, it's been, yeah, it's been good. Like there, there's really no way to manage it except just have the right people. And that can be very difficult because the right people are always in high demand. Right. You know? Yeah. So, um, so uh, why are, are you, are y'all a band or are you a solo artist that just has been able to use the same guys for 10 years? Yeah. I'm a solo artist and I've, and I've had, I've had the same drummer in North Carolina for, I've had Kevin for over 10 years. 
So there's my, never been a time that he's like, oh, I'm already booked. Do you just rearrange? Oh, no, there, there's 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 plenty of times. But my sub, believe it or not, was my drummer is my drummer before Kevin, before he was when I was a teenager. So Eric is is my second string, you know, drummer. Um, so, yeah, no, the the the, the rolled X is full. But it's a vetting process. And I like I'm saying, I'm fortunate that just the early stages of my career, at least regionally here in the in the southeast, I got pretty lucky um, because a lot of them were contacts from church or just random happenstance. Um, and and the bass player that I've got now is is fantastic. Otto, he's just really, really solid and, and a great personality like mm-hmm. you, you got to have both. Yeah. You got to have both. Yeah. Yeah. So no, but I, I feel, I, I feel your pain because there's nothing worse. And I, I remember one gig specifically in New York. I had a, I had a sub drummer come in and it was a train wreck Mm -hmm. because he didn't know the material number one and number two, it was at a, a really good venue and we were, we were trying to be effective and really make a good look. Mm -hmm. You know, number three, the tempo was speeding up so much. It was it it just got to the point where I just at the time, the management that I had at the time up in New York City, I just like kept looking at them from side stage. And I like it was just deer in the headlights because what are you going to do? You can't stop a 30, 40 minute set that you're opening up for some for a, a national touring. You can't just stop. Yeah. You know, and it's like it, it was just it was just so rough. I, okay. I think I'm still traumatized from it now, even thinking about it. But it <gasps> but it happens like you yeah. have to just push through and make it work. And and, you know, did the audience really know or understand what was going on? Eighty five, 90 percent of them, probably not. Yeah. But, you know, the musicians knew and it was yeah. just you know, whatever. But. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But it's all part of it. Yeah, it, it just it adds to the to the fabric and the memories, you know. Right. <laughs> so adds to the exciting, never dull, you know, life that we live as creatives. Are you in are you from Dallas originally? Yeah, I'm fr- well, I was born here in okay. Dallas, which I is where I am at the moment. I was born here, but I only lived here like a year. And then I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I used to talk like this. <laughs> and then uh and then I moved to Chicago for three years wow. when I was in the middle of sixth grade through like ninth grade. And then we moved back to DFW Dallas Fort Worth area mm-hmm. um when I was a sophomore in high school. And then I was here most of my adult life until 2018 is when I moved to LA and am now thinking I'm probably might be going back there soon. But um yeah, but most of my adult life was Dallas. You're in are you, you're in Charlotte? Uh, uh the Triangle area, which is two and a half hours east. So Raleigh Durham, Chapel Hill area. Okay. My yeah. sister my sister lives in Charlotte and my mom's not far from there. Too. Yeah, yeah. Charlotte's a nice spot. They have some good venues and it's very rootsy ish music for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Why yeah, did you the, up there? Are you from there? No, you're not. Uh, I'm from, well, yeah, I'm from Raleigh. I was born in Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, okay. My parents are from New York. So yeah. they, they moved down in the early nineties. Um, and then I was born and, you know, so Here you are. All, all my family's from New York and New York city. Like I had, there were as on the acting side of things, there were so many opportunities with like pilots. This is, pre-pandemic obviously pilot season whatever so it was either uh california it was either la or new york and i just knew new york so that's where i went Mm -hmm. but recently i started doing the california thing um as the pandemic has kind of subsided and i i love southern california i like i fell in love with it so not not crazy about some of the prices over there but yeah, you know uh, it's rough <laughs> it's um it's just it's like it's just it's like another world mm-hmm. it's just so beautiful yeah yeah i mean there's aesthetically and 
natural yeah surroundings it's unreal there's also there's a lot of good and bad about it out there you yeah. know yeah millions of homeless people and it's dirty and yeah. crazy expensive and the traffic but there's also an element of the creative probably similar in new york um but the creative like energy and i don't mean that in a new age way but like just there's so many creative people out there who have given everything up to go for the dream you know yeah that it's it's very inspiring all the time i mean everyone's grinding and hustling their life away the whole time and like hustle you know working five jobs just to survive but there's it's exhausting sometimes but it's also incredibly inspiring and right places like Dallas. And while there's some amazing musicians here, it's also very easy to get like super comfortable back into like normal status quo living and like, you know, not being feeding all that creative energy and staying super focused on like tapping into all those sides, you know? Oh yeah. And like, like you do music and acting, same thing. I mean, I was doing commercial acting and which, I mean, I haven't done a lot of, wouldn't say I'm like a big actor yet, but I want to take acting classes. You know, I've never done like theatrical or drama stuff. Um, but all of that kind of starts overlapping and especially in LA and New York, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. it's, you get opportunities in all these different kind of entertainment areas that start to overlap, which is fun. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things for me has been having, you know, a whole studio, it was hard for me to justify at, at certain, especially with the pandemic, because I was going to move to New York City right after college and, and then the pandemic happened. And I had I was about ready to sign a lease to move all of my studio equipment to a, a commercial space and had a really good deal set up for like the first six months. And thank God I didn't sign it because within two weeks, things just started falling apart in March of 2020. Mm -hmm. but um no there i get it because like i've i've kind of gone through the same thought process of you know i've been in north carolina my whole life pretty much spent a lot of time in new york city but never really made a a full jump to one of the major hubs for whatever reason there were some health issues that i was dealing with when i was younger there was the pandemic so the 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 irony of it is is that i've actually done more work in the pandemic mm -hmm. and since the pandemic in the last year than i think the last 5 or 10 years of my career That's awesome. and this is i so it's just like a it's a god thing mm -hmm. and every time i keep you know i've pressured myself to like you know i got to get it to got to get to la got to do this got to do that got like the door is never open and then as soon as i stop doing that it's almost like it's a wonderful life or something where it just comes to you where you're at. So it's kind of like this thought process and you can create these limiting beliefs. Right. And I, it's frustrating because I, I know like it's it's very L.A. is so enticing. It's so seductive for the creative mind. It's it's mm -hmm. amazing. Everything's there that you want as far as landscape and, you know, people and and mm -hmm. and and just the environment. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. There, there's something to be said about also, there's a lot of people that just make it that don't go there for right. years. And then they just end up there obviously for reoccurring work. Right. So there's no, there's no formula. Yeah. It's, it's really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I can't someone just lay it out. Right. right. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, the limiting belief thing is huge and I do believe that it can come to you wherever you are and yeah. you can make, obviously make things happen, especially we learned that in the pandemic. If nothing well, the, else. Yeah. I mean, with, with this show, I started it locally here in this space with multiple cameras and, you know, you can see those episodes early on. We still do them, but a majority of the episodes now are with fantastic people like yourself that I never would have thought of, you know, having on the show because of just what until the pandemic and everybody's locked up, not knowing what to do. And, uh, this has just been a huge blessing in my life. Yeah. The show. So it would, it, it would have never happened if it wasn't for that kind of constraint from the pandemic. Yeah. It's crazy yeah. how it works. I know a lot of, 
lot of good things came out of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, to kind of like start wrapping up, we, we definitely talked about your faith. I mean, if there's anything you want to touch a little bit more on, even outside of the, the experience recently, um, you know, by all means, please do, because we'd love to hear kind of your wisdom on, on your walk with the Lord and, you know, how you got to where you are. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't really take credit for it. For some reason, he just got a hold of me early. Yeah. Um, and I'm thankful because it spared me from a lot of things, not pain, but like, um, like mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes, but I can only imagine if I had not gotten close to the Lord at a young age, because I was always moving around and I, you know, my parents were divorced and then there's just like trauma as a kid. And if you don't know who you are and if you don't know God, you're going to turn to everything and anything and everyone to try to fill those aching places in your heart, you know? Right. And um, for some reason he, you know, at 10 years old, I'm sitting in church with my mom and I said, I want to do what the pastor's talking about when he was talking about how you can come to know Jesus. Yeah. And, um, and then I remember like when we, when they moved me in the middle of sixth grade when you're 12 or whatever to Chicago and p kids were so mean, mostly girls. It was all girls. The girls were so mean, like one day they'd be my, you know, you're my best friend. And the next day they would be like, we hate you go back to Georgia. And you, I mean, just like, but as a, when you're a kid and you're like that lot, you're already like, it just messed like every single day I went home crying and, and I would just get out this big Bible my mom had. And, and I remember got one time walking in the hallway and I just was like, I felt God say to me, like, I am your only constant in life. I'm the only one who's never going to leave or forsake you. I am where your confidence has to come from because people are always going to hurt you and betray you and leave you and reject you. And um, so thankfully I had that revelation at a young age um, because I had a lot of rejection or I, because of the way I, you know, interpreted that or trauma, you know, even divorced parents when I was eight, um, all that stuff, like you don't realize how much you just take in all of that stuff that wouldn't normally maybe feel like rejection, but because, um, so, I mean, it all still affected me a lot, but thank God, I, my core at my root, I knew that I knew God intimately and I knew that he was my rock and he was the one, if I had no one else and if I had nothing else, like he was enough. So that made a huge difference just moving around. And when all the stuff I would go through, it was like, I mean, there were, you know, there have been days in my life where I did not, I never wanted to like take my life, but I, I've been in enough pain where I would rather not wake up, you know, like, um, just like, yep. I wouldn't mind if I just keep sleeping, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, uh, been there, been there, done that. Yep. Yeah. And that was over a breakup, you know, of like, that just destroyed me or it didn't, but I, you know, felt like it at the time. But, right. um, even in those darkest, uh, days, like I know that's one reason I know the Lord so intimately because I chose to like cry out to him and to keep pouring myself into that. Even though there's, I've had a lot of times where I've been mad at God or, you know, he's okay with us, like having it out with him, you know, in a respectful way. Like I've, argued with him. I've yelled at, him. I've wanted to rebel just, um, but he's been, he's too good. When, when you know, when you spend time with him and you, you open your heart to the Lord and accept him and then have that personal relationship with him, it's crazy. And, and the more time you give him, the more he gives of himself. Like there's no limit to how much he's going to give you of himself and the things you start experiencing and the way you start hearing him and, the way you start seeing differently, um, like you can be in the worst time of your life, but he can give you eyes to see like in the spiritual realm and like yeah. realize that you're not going to be destroyed by this. Like it's brutal and it's painful, but he has, I always knew he had purpose in my pain. I always knew that he, he, I, he works all things together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So 
because I have that rooted in me, which is the same reason that's what came out of me with, with a gun to my head is because I, all the years I spent trying to seek him and grow closer to him and study the, his character and the Bible and all those things that I, it was so rooted in me that it makes, it's made me, um, you know, understand my identity and not be so like wavered by people, especially the older I've gotten, you know, like, um, it just has helped a lot with any kind of like, especially in our industry. I mean, we're constantly putting uh, ourselves out there and oh yeah, vulnerable and like, judge me, like, tell me no or yes. Like, you know, do you Love like, me. Am, I, am I, am I good enough? Do I have to audition for you again to be, am I pretty enough? Am I young enough? Am I blah, 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 you know? No, no, no. You know? Yeah. So, um, you have to be secure. Like, that's why so many, I would say not majority, but a huge amount of people in the entertainment industry go off the rails. They're either totally drugged up all the time. They're, uh, alcoholics. They're like, it's either drugs, alcohol. It's like constant, like who sex, who can I feed my next addiction with and like numb my pain with, and I'm not judging that, but I just thank God that I, that I, you know, have him and know him that he's enough without having to try to numb all my pain with all that other stuff. And that if, if people tell me no and reject me, like, I know that I'm still enough with who he made me to be, you know? Yeah. And that's tough in the entertainment industry. If you don't know that, then it's easy to like. Yeah. And even if you know it, it's still, it'll still creep up. Yeah. That carnal nature will still, you know, out of nowhere, just show up and, um, yeah, it took me years to just get to a place where I was a self, where I was self aware, yeah, of what was going on and how like I had a lot of ego problems and neediness, crap that was going on. I wasn't aware of it mm-hmm. until how you know a few years ago, really, and then within the last two years, really diving into what that is, what's going on there, and. It's funny though, because he'll use anything like he'll, he'll use anything and any motivator to, because he sees everything at once. And, and like, these are the whole multidimensional processes and revelations that I really believe we need to just, as his people need to keep pressing into, because that's really where the fresh revelation is and the fresh understanding of, Oh, okay. This is why I don't have to worry about this. Mm-hmm because you've already seen the end of me and you've called it good. And even though I can't understand it and I can't see beyond the 3d at times, unless you unveil it for me, well, okay. I have to believe this, you know, I just have to believe this and and keep moving forward and that the pain is with purpose or that whatever is going on is again, it's, you know, Proverbs three, five, six type of situation. So it's good stuff. It's yeah. it, it's hard to get your arms around it, but once in a while he'll, I, I well really every day I think there's just there's new there's new you know from glory to glory and just like un, uncovering the mysteries of him and it's just wild. Yeah, and especially in today's times, like it's the birth pains are happening. You oh know? yeah, it's like it's getting closer yeah. and closer, and he is about to like he's already moving in different ways in the earth and among his people than he has, but like he, it's getting more evident. I mean, the darkness is getting bigger and there's more and more like evil happening, but also God's showing himself in like bigger ways. And like every things are becoming more among people that really know him and are seeking him and are seeing that way. Like, you know, every, everything from things that used to be like, Oh, like prophecy and deliverance and healing and all that stuff is becoming much more like, like he's moving and he's moving. Yeah, and it needs wave. to it needs to be mainstream. Yeah. Like it it's becoming mainstream and it needs to be because it's like, why was this not around? That was the number one question I had as a six, seven year old was, you know, you hear about these miracles in the Bible. And it's like, all right, well, why are we not seeing it now? That mm-hmm. was the number one question I had is like a post toddler, you know, young, very, very young person. And that question haunted me for years until I started realizing, Oh, it's because 
what has been talked about is 90 something percent, not even what real Christianity is. Right. You know, and fortunately, I came from a household where it was talked about and it was experienced, but you don't know it until you personally really have that conviction and that revelation through your own testimonies and, you know, experiences. So, and that, that just takes him working it through you in his own way. And, and at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, when I ask you, you know, how did you get here? It's like, I don't know. He just got me here. That seems to be the answer for everybody in the kingdom because it's like, I have no idea, you know? Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. Um, I like ending with one kind of quick thing here, which is the, it, it's just the shootout which is uh, I, I say a word that's industry related to the guest and you just fire the first word back that comes to mind. There's like 10 of these. There's no right or wrong answers. Okay. Vocal. Coach. Oh, that's good. Sure. Like, is like that I said, what we're doing? No, yeah, I mean, yeah. No, no judgment. Whatever, co- whatever comes up. Okay. Stage. Fright. <laughs> Dance. Fun. Lights. Camera. <laughs> Songwriting. Depth. That's good. Studio. I know I'm supposed to be faster than that. Um, process. Ah, it's good. Guitar. Amateur. <laughs> Piano. Um, also amateur. (laughs) Dallas. Safe. God. Except for when it guns to my head. Right. Um, (laughs) God, everything. And the last one, uh, but the most important besides God, pizza. Fantastic. The last question I have for you is if you could go back in time to your 15-year-old self, knowing what you know now, what would you tell her? I've asked that before. Um, Well, kind of what I just touched on is that, you know, all of this, God's going to heal all of this rejection in you and and what these people say about you or how they treat you has no bearing on how he sees you or who you really are or your identity and um, all of the painful moments that you have that you're not going to be able to see past he's using to create this beautiful picture and story of your life and to make you into who he's designed you to be. And he's going to use that for his glory uh, for many years to come. (laughs) It's awesome. Where can folks find you besides your website, what are your social media handles and, and, you know, just kind of rattle it off for those that are driving and listening to this and not, you know, on YouTube or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, the website's lesleyaustinofficial.com. Um, I'm on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, all the title, all the streaming sure. digital platforms for music. Um, my, uh, Instagram is the Leslie Austin T H E. And then, L-E-S-L-I-E, Austin. And that's not because I'm narcissistic. It's because someone already took Leslie Austin. So I had, a, had to add the word the. <laughs> we, uh, we'll have all of the links, by the way, in the description boxes below. So they can just, you know, the listeners yeah. can uh, click um, and, and go straight there. Yeah. YouTube, Facebook. I'm on all the things. TikTok. I'm trying to do better. I know we're supposed to be doing them like right. three and four times a day. And I'm not, not quite... <laughs> I'm lucky to do one like once every couple of weeks, but, uh, yeah, I, I was, a I was a, 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 a TikTok partner for, well, still am, but was really heavily involved early in 2020. So, uh, off the air, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, throw, yeah, a, couple, yeah. throw a couple of tips. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's like a freaking full-time job, you know, to really yeah. work it. Yeah. Um, this was so amazing thank you so much for taking the time to be on and was really blessed by this and again thank you so much for just being so courageous and sharing your story um 
with oh, me thanks. and the listeners and everybody else where you've shared it already previously and will share it continually, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah, um, I, I appreciate you giving the platform, not only to share that and all this other stuff, but just to encourage like, you know, cause it's not always obviously in our day and age, it's not super popular to talk about Jesus or God or um, all of that. So I, any, that's why grant, you know, I got, I got shamed by some of these people who are like so angry inside that, and they think politics is, is life. And they just rage out of their political views right. because I was on Newsmax and it's right. a more conservative uh, station because I'm friends with Grant and he lives in Dallas and asked me to come on the show, not because it had anything to do with politics, yeah. but I got people, you know, saying all these nasty comments, not a lot, but like people It'll that happen. thrive off that. So, yeah. and I wrote back, I was like, I'm, thank God there's actually a man and a station that is willing to let me say the name of Jesus and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, promote God for the once on national, you know, television. So thank you for that also, because it's, oh, yeah. um, while it may, you know, be uncomfortable for some people and unpopular, it's, they're going to figure out if not now, then soon, they're going to realize that um, there is a God and that he's huge and insanely loving and better than they've ever imagined. And they'll, they'll meet him, you know, some way or another soon. <laughs> Amen. So thanks for, yeah. yeah, for being one of those platforms. Well, you're welcome. And, and thank you. You guys have been watching, listening to the Jason D'Amico show. Definitely check out Leslie's material, songs, incredible stuff out there, and be on the lookout for more of her original content. And we will see you all on the next episode. Peace.